Thanks for that. And you can certainly see the interest in the sector by the number of people in the room. It's absolutely fantastic, by the way. Uh, I heard lots of comments this morning already about a better deal for consumers, and uh, I can certainly tell you in my role as Chairman of the Australian Government's Financial Literacy Board, uh, that brings great joy to my uh, great joy to my life. So I, I, I thank you for that. We need competition. Absolutely wonderful. I bet it is first of all. I think any speaker should disclaim their various conflict of interest and biases, and I'm completely and hopefully conflicted. Um, so I started a company called IPAC 34 years ago, um, and funnily enough, you know, the environment today feels so much like 34 years ago, except different, and it's really fascinating to me. 34 years ago, I'd finished university and the usual sort of stuff you do, and along with a few of my uh, uni mates, um, uh, Piyush Gupta, uh, who's now main board NAB, chairman of MLC, and so on, Arun Abbe, who's running a family office, and Savan de Soisa, um, the lawyer. Uh, we thought, you know, as probably you do looking at the industry, uh, we, 34 years ago, looked at this thing called investment industry and said, this thing's just a bunch of crap. And um, we looked at an industry where, well, licensing, we didn't have an ASIC in those days, had a thing called the ASC, and to get a licence, you needed to collect the, uh, the coupons out of three packets of wheat bix and you'd, you'd send those in with your name on it, and um, you'd get your licence. Um, so early so-called managed funds, you remember the names, AFT, uh, Telford, oh, it collapsed, um, and so on. 8% entry fee, 3% management fee, and the consumers didn't even know about the MER, which was on top of all that. And you're thinking, that can't be true. Yeah, look, I know I'm the dinosaur in the room. I was telling the organisers, bring the dinosaur out early. Um, but basically, it is truly fascinating. So how could I possibly compare then to now? Well, in a sense, it's not quite as different as you might think. The, the revolution that Bob Hawke really started and happened globally, and of course in Australia, the key thing that gave me a chance to open IPAC in 83 was, of course, deregulation. And probably some of the stuff that you got, particularly a few years ago, is I, you know, when you're a young person, what do you do? You go out and you consult your peers. I'm much older than you. So I went out and spoke to people in the investment industry and said, look, you know, we want to start IPAC up. We don't know anyone. We've got no money. All we've got is, is academic qualifications, which back then were a mystery to the world of investment. And um, so, uh, and they said, what are you going to do? And they said, oh, we're going to, char we're going to set up a firm that charges people fees because this commission's crap. Now, how can you possibly speak, tell a consumer you're giving them advice when this crappy tax scheme pays 40%, when this shitty property trust eight pays 8%, when in reality, when back then interest rates were 13 14%, the best thing you probably do is pay down your mortgage? And of course, no one was getting that advice because of the bias around the remuneration system. Now, what did older Australians tell me? They said to me, oh, Jesus, son, that's not going to work. You know, people won't pay for advice. No one pays for advice. And we said, of course they don't. It's shit. But it was actually all right, they probably would. They pay lawyers and accountants and doctors, so if you're well qualified offering decent advice that's not around ripping people off, they will pay you. And so out of IPAC we built uh, quite a large business. Some 34 years later I'm still on the board. As my now three adult children say, hey dad, if you don't change your jobs every five years, your career's stuffed. How long have you been there for? Are you completely unemployable? And that's the dinosaur aspect of it. I've also, though, recently, and I'm going to switch a little between private sector and what I do for the government, but the, um, um, the basically, I've also, uh, um, you might have read in the media, about 18 months ago, I had a few institutions asking me about my next journey because they knew I'd gone non-exec at IPAC. I'm still very, very fond of the firm, by the way. It's 100% owned by AMP, and that tends to be the life of these growing businesses. Uh, the, uh, the, the group of us who owned it, just five of us, we had 20% each in the business for decades. And, you know, we started to get to the point where there was nine billion under management and offices in eight countries, and I think I was turning 50 back then, I'm now 60. And, you know, these things just get really, really big. And, um, and that, that's, that's a challenge in its own right. Getting big is a genuine challenge. It's fairly easy when you're small. It's easy around risk management. It's easy around client control. It's easy around many, many things. But the world changes. And so I uh, uh, had some institutions ask me to take a look at this thing called AWI, uh, which owns, um, owns uh, own 10, 10 fintechs, some of whom are here today, which is uh, fantastic. Names like Hashching, PayHero, Currency Spot, Simply Wall Street, Equities, MacReview, and so on. And that, that's, that's, uh, that's fascinating for me. But in a way, AWI on its own right, and I'm not here to talk too much about AWI, I want to talk about what we see around education, but I'm explaining where I'm coming from. What fascinates me there, in a sense, is that what we did at IPAC 34 years ago, and it's not just a place like AWI, InvestSmart, Intelligent Investor, Macquarie Bank are also heavily involved, so most of the major banks. I'm watching with fascination, as I think the next real bonus for consumers goes from the 8% entry fee, the 3% MER, and so on, 
And over time, of course, the change is extraordinary. 33 years ago, we tried, were trying to place around about $100 million in large cap US stocks. And that was a lot of money 33, 34 years ago, by the way. And uh, back then, we managed to do what we thought was a fantastic deal. We paid a 1% entry fee, and we were paying 1.5% per annum management fees on that money. What does it cost us today to, to, to have $100 million in US equities? What about two basis points if you don't negotiate a decent deal? Had my son home last night um, uh, from a, for a dinner, and he's now 28. And uh, I say, "Hey, mate, um, what are you paying on your super these days?" And he said, "Oh, Dad, it's look, it's still a bit toppy." He said, "But I've gone with the um, the host um, global indexed option." He said, "Look, it's four basis points, which is a bit toppy," and um, that's a big difference, isn't it? Four basis points on a re oh plus a dollar a week, pretty amazing, though, isn't it? So genuine consumer value, competition brings value, which is just fantastic. So in my little world, I'm really interested in what you're doing with my government hat on, but I'm particularly, uh, one of my private sector hat on, I'm particularly interested in what I kind of see as, as the next IPAC, because if you can inject technology, because what I do know about money is we're all completely unique, we all have very different goals and aspirations, but you know, over 34 years, the questions I get about money are consistently the same. Obviously, it's in my world, your world, they're calling it robo-advice, which is, you know, I guess it's kind of a trendy name. But the reality is, is as consumers and margins to consumers got driven down starting with deregulation, what I'm really excited about is I do think technology can drive margins down further. I think consumers can get better value. Because the reality is, putting all the crap aside, is that we are completely different, but gee, our questions are the same, you know? I tend to get the same question in the street all the time. I always, they always start off with the wrong question. Uh, you know, number one, you know, have you got a hot stock tip? And I go, no, why do you think I'm still working, you idiot? Um, <laughs> but it's always a good question for a financial advisor, isn't it? If you're so shit hot, why are you working? I always like that one. Um, because I, you know, basically the reality is, is what a good financial advisor does is really get you organised. We can't mitigate risk, it's just nonsense. We can help identify risk and we can stop stupidity, but the reality is we can't get higher returns than anyone else. But what we can do is get people organised and that helps no end. Having a plan is a really, really good thing. But can you get that plan, can you get that stuff using technology for less money? And I firmly believe you can. And that, of course, is why I'm involved in that part of the world and I watch with fascination. So that's my private sector out of the way. I've just declared my, uh, my various conflicts. With the government, you'll be pleased here, I've got absolutely no say in regulation. Uh, and that's probably a good thing because I wouldn't be able to do that because I'd be grossly conflicted. So I sit alongside Greg Medcraft, as uh, head chairman of ASIC. And of course, Greg is intimately involved in regulation. And where Greg and myself have very strong agreement is that you will not get good regulation without good knowledge. And here I agree completely with your comment. Your experience in England is exactly right. And as you know, we've now got 93 countries around the world are heavily engaged in trying to give their community better financial literacy. So if you like, I'm in charge of setting policy around knowledge, policy around education. And at the moment, you probably don't hear a lot from me, which is not a bad thing because it's, it's oh, look, I wouldn't like to say we've given up on adults. Uh, we haven't. Um, but the reality is, is nearly all of our work is going into the schools and universities. And now in our national curriculum in Australia, um, we've now got money skills being taught from kindergarten through to year 12. We've got hundreds of money smart schools. We've, we're training literally 260,000 teachers to implement. You've probably seen in the recent PISA testing, which did get some publicity. That's the stuff where you see in the papers. You read each year Australian kids are getting worse at maths and English. Well, I'm pleased to say in the PISA testing of Australian school kids, we actually came fourth in the world in financial literacy. Anyone care to guess which country's 14-year-old kids did the best in money skills? Beijing. Yep. Uh, uh, but we fourth was pretty good, actually. There are 93-odd countries participating in some of this testing. So I represent the government on the OECD around this area called knowledge. And it's a real challenge for you folk. And it's a real challenge because... The problem you have, and I have this with my private sector interests as well, is that I forever have teams of people telling me, we've written this in the most simple English we can write. And I go, yeah, yeah, what do you mean by that? And I go, well, says the marketing team, we understand we've got to write the brochure or the prospectus so a 14-year-old will understand it. And I go, good oh, let's pull it out. The problem is, of course, is that what they're trying to do is they've forgotten that the typical member of the public, and here you and I be in great agreement, we may as well be speaking in Russian. I don't care what you think. This is just the truth. 
So I see people saying, we're writing a prospectus so a 14-year-old could understand it. It's the simplest words they know, but the words are still Russian. We have a real communication challenge here. And it's very hard for consumers to get their mind around risk if they don't understand the language at all. A few simple ones. For example, the idiot who invented salary sacrifice and superannuation, I will personally find and shoot. Now, why would I do that? See, I mentioned salary sacrifice, and all you super intelligent people go, wow, that's great. And by the way, as a 60-year-old, what a rort that is, by the way. Bloody hell. Who invented this transition to retirement pension? Who stupid is that? I turned 60. Oh, I could have done it at 55, obviously, but I chose not to because at my level of income, the 4% pension I was required to take has some tax on it. It doesn't quite offset the 15%. So you think anyone understands this but you? No, they don't. I don't have first clue what we're talking about. But to you and I, it's fascinating for me uh, that I turn 60, so I convert my, my, my superannuation fund to a pension fund, which means all the money that the government's given me huge tax concessions to put in. Uh, younger people, thank you for giving me all those concessions. It's very kind of you. Uh, whether you let me keep doing it's another question. Uh, so basically, money goes in. I convert my, to a transition to retirement. I convert my super pension fund. I now pay no tax on my money inside superannuation. My 4% pension comes out, that's the minimum pension required, but of course, because I'm 60, guess what? Comes out tax-free. And then, of course, my director fees from my private interest, I can put $35,000 in at 15% rate of tax. And if I wanted to, I could put the 4% back in as well. Because obviously, any of us can put $180,000 a year into super of our own money, and we can bring it forwards three years, which means every third year, I can put in $540,000 into super, and my wife, who's secretary of our, uh, uh, of our company, can also put in $540,000. Bloody hell. The trouble is, though, guess what? We've just had a very, very financially literate conversation. So the trouble with even more simple words, we go out the government doing focus groups, and we use the word salary sacrifice with real people, and you know what salary sacrifice means to a real Australian? The boss comes in and says, times are tough. That's what salary sacrifice means. And where we need to be really careful, in particular where you need to be really careful, we need to help each other here. I heard the words in the previous panel about someone blowing up at some point in time. Let me tell you, no matter how clever you are, and I'm certainly not particularly clever, but I've been around a long time, so I've got a dinosaur smell for bad fish, I heard the word, when, if something blows up. Something will blow up. Not if, it will blow up. I don't care how clever you are, you do not change risk. Risk in shares, risk in property, and risk in mortgages, and risks in loans has never changed. Let's not do this again with our new world, because you know how regulation works in Australia. Regulation follows disaster, right? We tend to slam the door after the horse has bolted. And let's not use this sector, because what we're doing here, what you are doing here more specifically, what I will try and do is help give particularly younger Australians the language to better understand what you're telling them. People cannot participate effectively in financial services without understanding the words we speak, and it's a real challenge for us. The problem we'll have, of course, is not if, but when something blows up, regulation can really spoil this game. We need decent regulation, but it also is expensive for consumers. I mean, let's not go back too far, but in my times, um, myself and a guy called Stephen Van Eyck, uh, I was at IPAC back then, and Steve Van Eyck was at Van Eyck, obviously, and Steve and myself were the two guys who stood up in the late 80s um, and said a state mortgage is crap. A state mortgage attracted, what, half a billion dollars mainly retirees' money back then? It was a lot of money back then, billions of dollars in today's money. Of course, it blew up in a spectacular fashion. Luckily for Steve and myself, because we realised very quickly, Steve was worth about two and sixpence and I was worth about one and sixpence back then. And so we were both getting sued. And Steve, um, Steve was very scared about losing, uh, losing his house over that estate. The baddies have always got more money than the goodies. It's really aggravating. Uh, but luckily it blew up first, which is luckily for the litigation, uh, because the trouble is, you know what the law's like? You can be right and still have no house, right? It's a challenging issue, difficult issue for Australians, difficult issue around the world. And certainly uh, when a state blew up, I think Steve probably breathed a sigh of relief that we were, both he and I, and, uh, 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 were right. But on the other hand, we thought about those retirees who'd basically done their dough. I then spent a lot of time with the money program with cameras, particularly around the Gold Coast, filming solicitors' mortgages. Over a billion dollars of retirees' money got lost there. But what could go wrong? 
well, how could that have gone wrong? Because the deal was pretty obvious, wasn't it? What it was doing is that the, the ads were saying, basically, to conservative people, rates had dropped a little bit, so retirees were hurting. Anything sound vaguely familiar here? Um, basically, what they were offering was 4, 5, 6% more than your term deposit. And what the ad was, from two firms in particular who no longer exist, what the ad was is very simple. This is a solicitor's mortgage. It's really safe. Uh, why is it safe? Well, number one, it's a mortgage. And to retirees in particular, they don't understand many words, but one word they understand is mortgage. And you can play that game really hard. Because for most Australians, they take a mortgage, they're decent, honest people, they get the darn thing paid off, and everyone wins. Everyone's happy. A mortgage has got to be safe. And then, of course, these two particular firms who caused most of the damage said, we only lend to two-thirds of valuation. And it's true. When finally we got the regulators in there, they were only lending to two-thirds of valuation. What was the catch? The valuations were shonky. And so we found any number of $400,000 houses worth 100 grand. So you've got a two-third loan on 400. I mean, it's an old game, isn't it? But risk has just never changed. And we are not going to use technology and intelligence and a modern world. Risk profiles are not going to change. Uh, we know full well that uh, I'm looking at the moment, in fact, I was talking to Mr. Medcraft about this only last week, uh, a particular um, fintech online company is offering investors a safe 10% income return. Sound like a state mortgage to you? Does to me. Because we all know full well that if you're building, for example, around a consumer credit book, we all know full well, and the word was mentioned in the panel, Australians have forgotten what the word recession meant, do you think we're never going to go through a recession? Bankers in the room, you know full well what happens to consumer credit books when we go to recession. They turn to crap as well, right? And the other big challenge for everyone in the room, and me included in this one with my private interests, is that when you're little, all this is pretty easy. The two solicitors firms I spoke about, they're both obviously long since gone, by the way, they got blown out of the water for very good reasons. Um, but basically what is fascinating is that both of them actually ran really quite good mortgage books, two-thirds of, two of property valuation, and they ran it for years and years and years quite successfully. Quite successfully. What changed? Success. All of a sudden they started to run ads, and rather than dealing with a million dollars a month, all of a sudden they were dealing with 20 million a month, 30 million a month. Guess what? Couldn't get the money out the door fast enough. What happened to some of the early property trust managers like Australian Fixed Trusts? Australian Fixed Trusts were a perfectly decent mob. One of my first jobs as a, as a, a junior, fresh out of uni research person was to look at property trusts. The Telford Property Trust, I can never get my mind around. For the life of me, you do about five minutes work and discover all the properties were bought from the directors at a 10 times markup that the directors bought the week before. I mean, even I could work out that's a problem. Uh, but AFT actually weren't a bad mob at all. And what happened to them was their early trusts went really well. They took people's money in to buy property, they searched the market, they scoured the market, they found extremely good properties and they bought those properties. It went well. Because they bought good properties, they got good returns. Guess what happened? Tens and hundreds of millions of dollars started flowing in. Guess what happened? They simply couldn't buy properties fast enough. Guess what happened? They started buying shit. Guess what happened? Shit flowed to investors. So success can be a real challenge. And so I'm sharing the concern, I guess, in two, two aspects for me in particular. Number one aspect is that with the government had on, look, remember, I have no regulation, I'm only knowledge. A thousand percent supportive of why we're all here today. It is absolutely fantastic. I heard the words in the panel, consumers want a better deal, consumers deserve a better deal. We can do that. I'm not trying to be a Luddite here, or particularly to be a dinosaur. I'm simply trying to say that when we move ahead with, I think just, look, the, the stuff that can happen online now, and, and the stuff that I get to see in the meetings I get to go to, super bright young people doing wonderful things which is going to benefit consumers, I'm so excited about it. So please don't take this as a downer. This is an incredibly positive story for me. The wave is building, consumers want a better deal. A bit like Americans trying to vote Donald Trump in as president. I'm not sure how they really feel about Donald, but at least they feel as though he's sticking it up the establishment, OK? And there's a fair bit of that going on in this room, and I applaud you for it. Because often that's where consumer savings, consumer benefits come on. Good, good on you. That's great. But could you just please remember, I know this industry, this entire sector is going to be enormously successful. 
And I know you'll look at dinosaurs like me and say, no, it'll be different this time. The one thing I tell you is it will not be different this time. It'll be better for consumers, cheaper for consumers, more engaging for consumers. This is absolutely fantastic. Try and help me with your language. Please try and help me with your stories. Please read some of the basic research on how little consumers know. They don't understand compound interest. They don't understand risk. They don't understand salary sacrifice. They don't really understand a lot of what you're doing. So please do anything you can to help me, will you, to try and get people to understand. Because at the end of the day, we do want, I do agree completely, if we want higher returns, we need to take more risk. But a lot of this area is really, if you like, obviously we're all fully aware, and certainly in the case of investment, is in a sense, I know in AWI, for example, we cannot reduce risk. What we're trying to do is give consumers transparent exposure to risk at a much lower cost. And in a sense, the benefit comes from the lower cost. We can't mitigate risk, but we want consumers to understand risk. And if you can help me with that process, it would be just fantastic. Because again, the threat at the moment is we don't want, in a sense, we prefer to control our own destiny as a group of intelligent people around risk. And really for mine, the great threat, of course, is a very simple one, is that not if, but when something blows up, that's when regulation becomes a major issue. And let me tell you, I prefer that not to happen because regulation actually ends up costing consumers money. So I am anti-regulation, but if we stuff it up, all of us will be regulated. So please, don't, don't, it's, it's, not a, it's not a negative commentary. It's just a matter of the past is the past. And the one thing we will not change in our wonderful world is risk remains constant. And as you grow, please be aware of the past. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you very much.